Okay, well, um, all right, so I have two. Well, no, well, there's probably some announcements, but I have two things to say before I start. One is that there's, uh, you should be aware that the reading for next time is somewhat long. I should be aware of that too. What am I going to do? Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we have three different kind of immediate responses to Popper. Um, so uh, I mean, they all have certain things in common, which is probably most of what I'm going to actually talk about, what they have in common, but they, they're also different in certain ways, so they're, they're interesting. Um, and uh, and the other thing is a kind of non-announcement that I'm, I'm working on grading the paper, but I don't know when I'm going to be done. <laughs> so I'm all slowly start, but I hope to have them back soon. Okay. Um, so now on to chapter ten. So like. In between chapter five and chapter ten, and also the parts of chapter ten I didn't assign. It's mostly a bunch of kind of technical stuff about probability. Um, um, it's uh, I think similar to the technical stuff in the outbow. It's a lot of this is things that didn't work out really, at least not in the form we tried to do them here. We, we tried to fix them up later. So it's um, I mean, to really understand what he's saying, even in chapter 10, you have, I think you would have to understand more what, he's, what he thinks about the use of falsifiability and not going into probability and whatever. But again, since at least I think the way he tried to deal with those things here was turned out not to be completely satisfactory, even if not, but it's the details are maybe not that important. Um, um, I, I will mention one important point about degrees of falsifiability when it, when it comes up. But, um, okay, so, um, so the issue, uh, in this reading is basically like this stuff. That's an everyday reading. Same class of students. Okay. Uh, so this reading is basically about like um, well it's kind of about two questions why does why and how does science make progress and um Kind of uh, what is it good for? So I mean, these are completely separate questions. I guess you know when you say that something makes progress, you mean that it's going on in some direction, but hopefully it's like the good direction. <laughs> you know, otherwise it wouldn't really describe it as progress. Um, Although we'll see that's that that's not so clear. But anyway, like, so why does science make progress and what is it good for is related because you want to know like why does science why does science and the theories succeed each other in a certain way? And in what way, how is that kind of succession good for anything? Um And um, from we expect Popper's answer 
to these questions should have something to do with the demar this demarcation criteria. Right? That is, uh, the demarcation criteria is a proposal for telling the difference between science and other things that are not science. Um, so, uh, it's going to be a good proposal, presumably, if, well, so, I mean, as far as this first question goes, you know, since going back to the beginning of the course, I keep saying, like, the thing that impresses philosophy about modern science is the way it makes progress, right? the way it's successful, in a way that the philosophical inquiries about similar questions did not really make progress. So, um, so uh, if we're proposing a way of defining science, hopefully that proposal will explain why the thing that is so defined makes progress. Um, and also, hopefully, it will explain why uh, um, that's a thing we should want to have, <laughs> whatever it is that meets that definition. Um, so, you know, if the if the answer to these things turns out to have nothing to do with the demarcation criterion, then it looks like the rules of the game that Popper is proposing aren't per se the rules of the game that's worth playing. Um, okay, so I mean, so it's pretty important for Popper at this point to address these questions, but it's also especially important because Popper's opponents, like the verificationist or justificationist or inductivist, seems to have really good answers to these questions. So that, um, right, that inductivist faced with these questions will say, well, first of all, as time goes on, we accumulate more observations, right? So we have more records of singular facts, empirical facts. Um, and the more facts we have about the more different things, first of all, because according to the inductivists, gathering these individual empirical facts helps justify universal theories that predict them. The more of these individual facts we get, in general, the better, better justify our theories will be. Um, and also our theories will become more universal as time goes on because we gather facts about of different kinds. So um, we're going to get um, justification for more general rules than we have before. Or I guess, I mean, you could put it this way that like for, you know, the specific theories will get better justified and meanwhile, you know, we'll get more general theories that are as justified as the specific ones used to be, right? So like for a given level of universality, we're getting more justification. And for a given level of justification, we're getting more universality. Um, and, you know, um, um, by more universality, I mean, so, you know, this is, I kind of talked about this before, but I'm going to bring it up again because I think it's like you can see it's the same question coming up and it basically gets the same answer. What is, so, right, so anyway, so like the inductivist is going to say the answer to this is more data means justification and more universality. So what I was about to say that I already discussed once before is what do we mean by more universality? Right? So like I mean if you have a theory that says for all x something or other and this 
ranges over spatiotemporal locations, then it's already it already says everywhere and always. So in a sense, like you can't get more universal than this. Um, um, but nevertheless, we can understand what it means for if we start with a theory for a new theory to be more universal. It means that the new theory like explains all the successes of the old theory and more things. So, uh, so they, they, you know, they both say something about what happens everywhere and always, but the new theory, like, has as one of its consequences everything that the old theory said, and then it has further consequences. Um, and again, like the inductivist can explain why that will happen. Because we'll get, you know, new data all the time, some of which they like, was neither pred predicted nor forbidden by the old theory. But we're going to find a more general theory that does predict it, and that will start to get justified. Yeah. Are the um, the levels of universality something like if I make a claim about a certain like a beaver, then I move off mammal, then animal, then living things, or is it something like if I make a spatial temporal claim, then I can then the more universals it applies to more spatial temporal locations. Versus if, like if I make a claim about something in Australia, it can apply to things in the U.S. and more and more. But which which one of these is it? Or is it both? Yeah, I guess I'm saying it isn't exactly either of those that, right? It's, well, I mean, or it's, so if you have strict universal theories, now, you know, obviously this is Popper's criteria. I don't know if we can expect the inductivist to agree that we're using strict universal theories, but let's say you agree we have strict universal theories. So they say something about everything. Right? Like if I have a theory that all swans are white, you know, I'm saying that wherever and whenever there's a swan, it's white, you know. So, um, um, so that's why I'm saying if you, like, if you just ask how much does the theory talk about, you're not going to be able to get levels of universality that way. I, so, I mean, I think what Popper has in mind when he talks about levels of universality. And this is the same thing I said before when I asked, like, in what sense are the axioms the most universal statements in the theory? Right? And Popper said, remember, way back when in chapter one, right? right? He said a scientific theory is a system with, like, or like, ideally at least, should be an axiomatized system with the most universal principle at the top, and then you deduce all the other ones from those. And I said, like, what, in what sense are they more universal? And I think it's the same sense as here. They're more universal because the, all the other ones can be deduced from that, not vice versa. <laughs> so, um, um, so, I mean, like, it could be that the old theory didn't imply much out of certain spatiotemporal regions, and the new one will include more, or that the new one, you know, the old one only implied things about beavers, and the new one implied things about all mammals. But just generally speaking, the logical situation is just that the old one, you know, the new one implies the old one and more things. Just like you know, the axioms imply this lower level statement and all the other lower level statements, and that's why they're more universal. So, um, um, okay, so anyway, so according to the inductivist, if science is done right. Unless there's like an empirical cat catastrophe, so to speak, right? So, like, uh, the, as the inductivist knows, we can't logically rule out that starting tomorrow, all the data will completely disagree with all our old theories, <laughs> right? And we'll just have to start over again. <laughs> um, but 
if it's really true, as the inductivists say, that you know empirical observations make the theory that predicts them more probable, more likely to be true, better justified, then by definition, that kind of catastrophe is extremely improbable. So, um, so you know, like to revive this a little bit, it's not for sure that this will happen, but it's very, very highly probable according to the inductivists that if we do science correctly and we keep gathering more and more data, we'll um, can, you know, build up more justification for our old theories, and we'll begin to justify broader theories that imply them. Um, so the old theories will turn out to be like special cases of the new theory. Um, sometimes it might turn out the old theory was kind of a hasty overgeneralization. So it, it's not exactly the old theory that's a special case of the new theory, but the old theory limited to its proper domain is a special case of the new theory. And so, I mean, like the type of example that, that people have in mind here, and Hoffer is also going to have in mind, is um, the transition from Newtonian mechanics to relativity, right? So, like Newtonian mechanics, it's Relatively, you know, relativity, strictly speaking, says Newtonian mechanics was false. <laughs> but Newtonian mechanics was, you know, um, makes the right predictions, more or less, as long as things aren't going too fast relative to each other, or gravitational fields aren't too strong. So relativity can explain all the successes of Newtonian mechanics. Um, that is, relativity predicts that in the in all the cases where we used to collect evidence, that Newtonian mechanics will look right or almost right. So again, so like it turns out that Newtonian mechanics wasn't exactly right, but it was just like you know we prematurely concluded that everything would be like these slow things that we normally deal with. Um, but you know, so relativity theory says, well, no, Newtonian mechanics is right or almost right, but only in the realm of things that are going slowly. So, um, so that's the kind of progress we can expect very probably according to the inductivist. And the answer to this, what is it good for, seems uh, to fall out of this obviously because. Right, so the theories are getting more justified means they're more likely to be true. So they're more likely to yield correct predictions. Um, and um, that explains why science is really useful. Because <laughs> you're getting, I mean, to the extent that what you need in your life, like for planning and decision making and whatever is good predictions. Um, this is getting better and better at giving you the right predictions. So your life is getting better. <laughs> um, so um, um, so the answer to the question, like, why do science, at least the most important answer, according to this point of view, is going to be, well, to, you know, for the good of humanity, right? I mean, the more we do this, the better justify that is more likely true theories we have, and therefore the more useful they are. And, um, you know, although, that obviously won't solve all our problems. It will definitely solve plenty of problems <laughs> to know what's going to happen next, right? So, um, so, so again, Hopper's opponent seems to have like very 
uh, clear answers to these two questions. Of course, like all of that depends on it being rational to take your theory to be more justified when these singular statements agree with it. Um, So, and unfortunately, Popper has argued, well, so first of all, right, so that's, this is the, you know, principle of induction. It says we can go from singular statements, to universal statements. Now, I mean, and it's it's important it's always it's important to always keep this in mind because why do i say it's important because i know that people often get confused about this that you know what popper's saying is not just that you can never be completely sure that your universal theory is true no matter how much evidence you collect everyone knows that <laughs> right i mean inductivists know that too yeah, you can never be completely sure that the universal theory is 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 correct. You, you know, that new evidence could come in that, that makes it look different. But um, but what the inductivist is saying is it becomes more likely that it's true as you gather more evidence. It becomes more probable that it's true. And Popper is denying even that. <laughs> Right, so Popper is saying it's not just that these singular statements don't completely justify your universal theory. They don't justify it even a little bit. And so remember his argument for that was, well, that first of all, this connection is not logical. This isn't a logical deduction. If this were a logical deduction, we wouldn't really need a principle of deduction. It would just all be deduction, right? So, um, uh, but it, you know, it isn't true. The singular statements certainly don't imply the universal theory. They also don't imply the, the, the theory that the universal theory is probable. Right, so not like the inductivist wants to say, oh no, of course the singular statements don't imply that this is true, but the singular statements imply that that this thing is probable. And Popper says, well, okay, you have the same problem here you had before. <laughs> this isn't a logical connection. So, um, so it's not a logical connection. Um, and it can't be empirical. So it can't be empirical either in the inductivist sense or in Popper's sense. I think before uh, Popper argued that it can't be empirical in the inductivist sense. And that's pretty easy to understand, right? It's, it's, it's a, the problem is circularity. Or as he, he says, it's infinite regress. I guess it depends how you look at it. But the point is, right, like for this to be empirical in the way the inductivists understand that, it would have to mean that we believe that this works because we've seen it work so many times. But then we need this very principle, or the way Popper puts it, this is why it says infinite regress, you need another principle of induction to justify your belief in the first principle of induction. Okay? I think looking at it circular is more easy to understand. But anyway, one way or the other, that obviously won't work. From Popper's point of view, it, this also can't be empirical. So, what from Popper's point of view, for it to be empirical, it would have to be falsifiable. Um, but remember, like you can't tell that a theory is falsifiable necessarily just from examining its logical implications. You have to know how it's going to be used. 
like whether it's being used as a falsifiable theory or not. So, I mean, you could regard, you could use this principle of induction as a falsifiable theory. Right? Here's how it could be falsified. You know, um, I get a bunch of singular statements. I conclude that some universal theory is really probable to be true. But it turns out it's not true. <laughs> so the principle of induction is falsified. Um, but, you know, Popper says, if that's the way you meant this, then yes, it's falsifiable, but also it's already been falsified many times, right? Like every time you ever had to discard one theory in favor of another theory, because the evidence started coming in different than you expected, the principle of induction was falsified. So Popper says, obviously, they don't mean it that way, right? They mean the principle of induction is something that continue to believe no matter what happens. So when you know when the when the old theory turns out not to be true, you'll just say, well, okay, uh, let's see what theory is justified, what new theory is justified by all the data. Right? You won't say, oh, I guess theories aren't justified by data. So the principle of induction is not meant as to be used empirically in proper sense of empirical either. And therefore, it must be a metaphysical principle. So if it's a metaphysical principle, like, okay, it could be synthetic a priori. Which basically just means something that's not, not a logical connection, but that we know um, without any basis and experience has to has to hold. Right? That's what synthetic a priori is. Popper again in, in this chapter says uh, without any argument that well, of course not all. He actually he calls it an ubegu. <laughs> I don't know exactly how it translates, but the Greek means concept. So, like, a Uber Greek is like a non concept, <laughs> like the nonsensical idea, basically. That's the synthetic, synthetic a priori. Um, or maybe it means an incomprehensible synthetic a priori. I don't know. Anyway, he doesn't say why. I think. He, he doesn't feel a need to go into that because that's something that he and the Vienna Circle people agree about. So everyone agrees that there's no synthetic a priori, and so he's not going to waste any time arguing about it. Um, so uh, if it's not synthetic a priori, what can it be? Well, like uh, basically, it must be practical. And then Popper's response on that point is, but practically speaking, this is a bad thing to believe. Right? Because it means that you believe that you should be out looking for observations that confirm your theory. Yeah. So then would induction be like a form of methodology, but just a bad one? Yeah. Basically? Yeah, so I think so I think like in the end proper, you know, reduces this down to saying, uh, look, that you know, this is really just a proposed methodology, and it's a bad proposed methodology because it will lead to dogmatism. But you know, so that leaves proper. However, so, so, you know, this looks nice, but it won't work because induction won't work. I mean, that is, it won't work as a theoretical doctrine and it shouldn't be adopted as a practical doctrine. 
So we don't have this simple story about why science makes progress. Um, so, um, So the basic issue here is that there's no solution to Hume's problem or the problem of induction. Um, Wondering about whether I'm approaching this from the right angle or not. I guess I'll just go on. <laughs> um, so maybe I'm just having trouble with the transition here. I think I understand what I want to say next. I'm just not sure. Well, okay, never mind. So, I'll, so yeah, maybe I can put it this way. So, like. If we had some kind of solution to the problem of induction, we go ahead and answer this question. We just said we don't have a solution to the answer to the problem of induction. Or we have like a negative solution to the problem of induction. Right? So the problem of induction is how are we justified in, you know, how can our theories be justified by singular observations? And the answer is they can't. <laughs> so um, so you might think that was the end of the story, but um, in the um, addendum that he added to this chapter in 1972. So yeah, I continue to be a little confused about when the various stuff was added. I think most of the star stuff was added in 1959, actually. But this addendum was added even later in 1972. So anyway, in this addendum, Popper says, well, you know, it depends what you mean by the problem of induction. <laughs> and then he lists four different problems of induction, basically. So, um, and the first one he calls the logical. This is coming out to the edge of the scene. The logical or epistemological. Problem. And it has two parts. Um, Well, the first part, justification, and the second one, preference. So the problem of the logical or epistemological problem of justification is what all along he's been calling the problem of induction. How can we how can our theories be justified by singular observations? And right, that is, how can it be rational to believe our theories are likely true based on singular observations? And this is the one that has a negative answer. But then there's part B, which says, um, how can we rationally justify preferring some theory at some time to some other theory at that time? Assuming what we care about is truth or truth likeness, right? This is this term that he uses verisimilitude. Similarities of the truth. 
um, assuming that you know what we want from our theories is to be similar to the truth. Uh, can we rationally? How can we rationally justify preferring one theory to another theory? And this proper says, "Oh, I have a positive solution to this." Right, and the positive solution is the thing that he discusses a lot in the text, corroboration. Right, some theories are better corroborated than others, and it's rational to prefer the better corroborated theories. So I'm going to come back and discuss what that is in more detail. Um, And then secondly, okay. secondly, there's a metaphysical problem. The metaphysical problem is, are there genuine regularities in nature? And Popper says, the metaphysical problem raised by the idea of verisimilitude is, are there genuine regularities in nature? My reply is, yes. <laughs> so um, Popper has a positive answer to the metaphysical problem. Yes, there are genuine regularities. I mean, what is that? What that yes is best based on, obviously, is what we have to <laughs> try to figure out. But of course, because it's metaphysical, it's not based on experience, right? I mean, it's not scientific. This is definitely outside the demarcation criteria, right? Like, it's the claim that there are genuine regularities in nature is unfalsifiable, as is the claim that there aren't genuine regularities. Because if I say there are genuine regularities in nature, and you say, look how chaotic it is, there's no regularity at all. Well, you know, the regularity can be as complicated as you want, right? So no matter how chaotic it is, it could still be regular. It could still be regular. It's just the regularity is too complicated for me to understand, right? So it's so like the claim that there are genuine regularities is unfalsifiable. And the claim that there aren't genuine regularities is also unfalsifiable because no matter how regular it seems so far, tomorrow all the data could go the other way, right? So this is a metaphysical question, and, and Popper, you know, true to his what he said way back um, when in 1972 is still taking the same position that metaphysics is not nonsense and it's not necessarily bad, it's just not science. And he has a metaphysical answer to this metaphysical question, and the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, so um, the third one is what I would call a pragmatic question. Does he use the term pragmatic here? But by the way, so Popper actually, I hope this isn't too confusing. In the addendum, there are um, six numbered points, uh, but not all of them are separate question problems of induction. <laughs> so, like in between this and that. This number three, and this is actually point number four, but I'm only numbering the problems of induction because that's all I'm going to, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So th these numbers don't match up with Popper's numbers. So, oh yeah, he does call it the pragmatic problem. The pragmatic problem of induction. So the pragmatic pra problem of induction is um, like, uh, why is it rational to rely on the theory that we've worked with? Right, that is to you know plan and make decisions based on it. And then the final problem is the psychological problem of induction. Right, 
which says, which is um, why do we tend to believe that the well corroborated theory is true or is at least similar to the truth? Right? It has verisimilitude. So what he says about that, but so I, I had I skipped over what he says about this because basically what he says about this is going to be tightly connected to what he says about this, right? Like if we can understand why it's rational to prefer one theory to the other, hopefully that will help us understand why it's also, also rational to act as if that theory were true. All right, but on the, the psychological problem, why do we believe that the theory so chosen will continue to be worthy of our trust? Is, I suggest, trivial. A belief or trust is always irrational. <laughs> Right, so right, so the answer is, you know, we do tend to believe that these that the theory that we prefer is true or is similar to the truth. That's not rational, but it's not a problem that it's not rational because belief is never rational. <laughs> um, I mean, that's something I've kind of been like. I guess giving a like foreshadowing all along as I discuss Popper that you know the situation is not one where we're like how can I form a belief and we're searching for a way to, to form a belief the situation Popper says is one where we always are believing things even though we don't have a good reason <laughs> and the question is what to do then. <laughs> So um, what is it rational to do that? So belief isn't rational, but the way I um, proceed in the face of my belief can, could be rational. Um, So, like, the real problem here is to understand what's going on here. Um, like, how, given that our theories are just guesses, and all we're trying to do is falsify them. And by the way, I guess, you know, the inductivist at this point is going to say, you know, it's probably not going to be very hard to falsify them. They're just guesses. <laughs> it's kind of an easy task you set for yourself, right? So your theory, is, your theory is just a guess. And if the theory does get falsified, we just guess again. How can we make any progress in any direction? And if we do make progress somehow, how is that going to be progress we would care about if we care about truth? And then, right, so, so that's this problem. And then, but moreover, if the progress isn't progress we would care about if we care about truth, then it looks like it's also not progress we would care about if we care about usefulness. Okay. So, this is kind of mysterious. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, so in answer to this, first of all, Popper says, well, um, actually, the um, science does make progress in pretty much exactly the way that inductivists would lead us to think it would make. Would, predict, I guess, 
to make it would make progress. This is so like the inductivist argument is um, starts on page two forty nine. By the way, this is probably also something I should I should call attention to. I mean, um, although, so I'm not sure, but like. What am I not sure about? <laughs> um, so, like in everyday life, when we're arguing about something, usually I'll try to say only things that favor my side of the argument, and none of the things that favor the other side of the argument. Right? And if there's things that favor the other side of the argument, I'll hope you don't notice them. <laughs> but philosophers, you know, and I guess proper. Uh, maybe you can give a good explanation for this. I don't know if it's the right explanation, but anyway, for whatever reason, philosophers will tend to spend a lot of time saying things on the other side of the argument, and then at the end showing it's wrong. <laughs> right? So, but that obviously can be confusing, especially if you come to a text like, but you see, that's, this is what I'm not sure about. Is it because, so like, especially if you come to a text like looking for quotes at the last minute <laughs> and you open up to a page where the philosopher is arguing from the opposite of their point of view, then you're, you're likely gonna get a quote that <laughs> doesn't say what the philosopher actually thinks, but the opposite, right? But I think even if you are just reading, you know, and, and trying to pay attention. I mean, I've seen this like with the first meditation, very confusing text. Because the first meditation contains arguments back and forth between the meditator and, and themselves, right? Like, you know, uh, uh, whatever I've learned from my senses must be true. But sometimes I have seen things, you know, that turned out not to be true. But, you know, <laughs> back and forth, right? So, like, yeah. It's so anyway, Popper does the same thing here, starting on page 249 with it is quite true, they said, right? So it is beginning with it is quite true, they say, and going to the end of that paragraph. Um, everything Popper says is basically like the argument, the inductivist's answer that I was going through before. Right, they they say that science will accumulate, you know, facts and we get more justified, or whatever. But then the next thing Popper says is, there is something to be said for the above argument. <laughs> but it does not affect my thesis. So, like, what he immediately goes on to say about it is that um, what's to be said for this argument is this. He says, it expresses the metaphysical faith. Um, so, I, I know I've mentioned this before because it comes up in Parnas. It says one German word, Glaube, which can be translated as belief. Which you translated as depends on the kind of the tone of the sentence, I guess, right? I mean, it's like it's actually not that easy to say in English what the difference between belief and faith is. Um, in some contexts, they're interchangeable, but in others, it would sound weird to use one or the other, right? So, like, so I think that I, I think um, Popper made the right choice here: metaphysical faith. It expresses the metaphysical faith in the existence of regularities in our world, a faith which I share and without which practical action is hardly conceivable. So there's even a little bit of an argument for this metaphysical faith here, right? In that, that addendum where he says, or in that, that clause where he says, and without which practical action is hardly conceivable. Um, 
But leaving that aside, right? So, so, so one thing he's saying that there is to be said for the adductivist argument is that um, um, if it's understood as a metaphysical statement about the, that the world isn't really gonna suddenly change, <laughs> um, that there really is a world we're trying to find out about. Popper says, yeah, I agree with that. Um, but that doesn't affect the methodological situation. Um, so, I mean, that's part of, that's one way he, he has an agreement with this, but he also um, agrees with it in somewhat more detail. So, um, Oh, I see. So I think he agrees with this part of what the inductivist says. This is towards the top of page 250. The old theory, even when it is superseded, often retains its validity as a kind of limiting case of the new theory. So that is, um, he not only agrees like a metaphysical level with the inductivists, that, that we really are, there really is some regularity that we're trying to get our theory to agree with. But he also agrees that in general, our theories will um, um, tend to not just succeed each other randomly like random guesses, but that each new theory will tend to include the old theory as a limited case. Yeah. So then what is the difference between corroboration and justification? And I'm, they seem practic practically the same thing, but like in Popper's kind of like uh, <laughs> deductive mind, there's a difference, but I can't really see a difference. Yeah, that's that's what I want. So I mean, and for so like obviously that is the big question about corroboration, right? Like as soon as people, and he even says to describe this kind of progress that science makes in the inductive direction, that is, it gets to more and more universal theories. He says there's a kind of quasi-induction. So, you know, when, when he starts saying, well, it's not verification or justification, it's corroboration, and it's not induction, it's quasi-induction, then you start worrying that maybe he's really given away the whole game, right? Because, like, said, oh, yeah, well, I wouldn't call it induction, it's quasi-induction. But um, but I but I think that he actually does have a a completely different explanation for what these things are. Um, in which um, so this quasi induction you know, we get to theories that are more universal and better corroborated, but that's not at all the same as saying that they're more justified, more plausible. That's, that's the key issue, right? So, um, well, is that the key issue? I mean, there's, there's kind of two key issues. It depends on which you put first, right? It's like, um, is the key issue this epistemological issue? Does the theory become more justified? Does it become more rational to believe it's true as this process goes on? Um, if not, then we're not really talking about the same thing that the Dectorist is talking about, even if it resembles it in some ways. And he's saying it does resemble it in some ways, right? So, um, but I guess the other key thing is, um, does this really have different methodological implications? 
right? Like, does this tell us to go out and do something different than the inductivist methodology would tell us to do? Um, which, I, I mean, I think from Popper's point of view, this, the, 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 there, those things are both important questions, but the first one is important because of the second one. Um, so, um, so, I mean, so to understand uh, what this is and how it's supposed to be different from induction and how corroboration is. We have to how corroboration is supposed to be different from justification. I have to get into some details of what Popper says corroboration is. Um, so first of all, this term corroboration. Uh, So Popper says in a footnote here that he chose this as the translation of the German word is there. Um, so like the verum has vara, which means true actually. So like this is even closer to verification in German. But he says that. Um, he chose this term in German because he thought that it was neutral between justification and um, what he thought a theory should have. So, um, and then he um, he says, it has a whole story about how Carnap suggested translating as confirmation, and at first he was okay with confirmation, but then he decided that was a mistake. And he went into corroboration. Um, so in this book, he translates it as corroboration. And so, like, um, what corroboration and the and justification have in common is that they're ways of appraising the theory. Right? So these are two different ways of appraising a theory, appraising it to determine which whether we should pre prefer it to another theory or not. So, um, so like basically, you know, leaving aside the whole story about what it was the German, et cetera, et cetera. This is just a technical term for whatever it is. The respect in which Popper thinks we should appraise theories when we compare them to each other. And he says it's really like he only really tries to define, um, uh, he doesn't try to define, at least not here, an absolute degree of corroboration. He just tries to say what it means that one theory is better corroborated than another. Because that's the situation we really have. We, we always have an old theory and we're comparing it to a new theory or something like that. We want to know which one is better corroborated. Um, Not that fun. I was trying to figure out what I was going to say. All right. Um, so, uh, 
just trying to figure out whether to go into this detail or not. Popper emphasizes it. I'm not sure how important it is. But he, like, he emphasizes the corroboration, or but I think this is true of any appraisal of the kind he's talking about, is like not really the same kind of thing as truth or verisimilitude. Um, that um, it's uh, because truth or verisimilitude. I don't know, something moves or like, I guess I'm tired. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, um, because truth and verisimilitude are, as Popper says, like timeless properties of the theory. Right? Like, if the theory is true, if the theory is true now, it was always true. I mean, so, like in real life, uh, for singular statements, this isn't exactly the way we usually think about it. Like, I mean, I might say, you know, now it's false now that the eraser is on the table. Now it's true that the eraser is on the table. So, like, we kind of think of statements as changing truth as time goes on. Like, so. And it's kind of a little bit unnatural what what you learn to do in philosophy, or what you should learn to do in philosophy, which is to like say, no, those weren't the same state. You know, there was a time in this, <laughs> right? And so what I really meant is that the eraser is on the table at time t one is false, and it'll always be false, and has always been false, and that the tape. Right. So, but fortunately, because these are strictly universal theories, you don't have to worry about them. These theories say something is true everywhere and always. So, of course, if they're true now, they're always true. Yeah. Is it kind of like something? So, something can be practical and relevant, but not necessarily true. And that's kind of like the nature of the problem of induction. And like the reason that he has even some faith in induction. Well, I. Um, but it's a practical and like useful yeah. in some regard. Yeah, well, I mean, something can be useful. I mean, um, a belief can be useful even if it's false, right? I mean, Um, but that's not actually what he's talking about. That, that's not the distinction he's talking about here. I think he's talking about saying that, I guess I didn't finish my, my thought, right? So one side of the thought is the truth or the verisimilitude are timeless properties of the theory. But corroboration, or for that matter, justification, are properties the theory has only relative to a certain body of evidence. And as the body of evidence changes, the degree of corroboration or justification will change. Yeah. He says that uh, truth and verse uh, yeah, are timeless properties. Is that a logical or metaphysical statement? It's a grammatical statement. I don't know. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like. I don't know if you would, I guess you would classify that as logical, right? I mean, but it's, I mean, it's, that is, he's telling you like how we use these words or how he uses them anyway, right? It's, it's more just like semantics. Yeah, I mean, it's, I guess you could look at it as semantic. Maybe that's the same thing as what I meant by grammatical. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, it's the kind of properties these are is they're supposed to be timeless. They're not, they're not supposed to need a, a time index, <laughs> right? Whereas the type of property that corroboration is is not like that. But the theory's degree of corroboration changes as time goes on. 
And you know, it's relative to a body of evidence, but it turns out it's also relative to a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> so, um, um, like I said, I don't know. I mean, Popper, F, Popper emphasizes this difference between these appraisal terms and the truth, truth and falsehood type terms. I'm not sure I understand why it's important, so maybe I shouldn't have gotten into it. Um, but I mean, it, I mean, it's not, yeah, so is this just, I mean, partly this has to do with proper, the difference between proper and pragmatists. Right, which he actually discusses, you know, so like a pragmatist might say the theory is becoming more true as time goes on, or something like that. And he says, no, that's a, like a saying that's a misunderstanding of how we use the word or something. But yeah, in fact, he does say that, right? He says, so if we accept it, now I remember, he says, if we accepted the pragmatist proposal and use truth, that way, so that the theory's truth changes as time goes on, we would need to introduce a new term for the timeless thing. <laughs> right, so, so he's saying we may as well stick with using these words the way we did before. So, um, right, so we're getting back to this. So how, like, what does the degree of corroboration of the theory depend on? So, I mean, first of all, corroborated can't just mean that it's not falsified. I mean, that's kind of like a first pass in it, and that's required. If the theory is falsified, then its degree of corroboration is zero, <laughs> right? But obviously, this isn't sufficient, both in the sense that there are way too many theories that aren't falsified. Right, I mean, so again, like falsified, again, unlike false, I mean, falsified is the right kind of thing to put in here. It's a kind of appraisal. It changes as time goes on, but it's um, not, um, not a good equivalent for corroborated because, so first of all, at, every, at any given time, there's only a finite amount of data, so there are infinitely many theories that are not falsified by that kind of data. Um, um, well, I mean, maybe most of those infinitely many theories we can't actually understand, I think. That's, the, like, that could be a worry here. But it seems like even, Sticking with theories that we can actually say, there's still going to be, it's, it's way too easy to come up with theories that are not falsified. Like all animals are group. <laughs> right? So, you know, at any, at any time before T where all animals are green is green, <laughs> is not falsified. All animals are group is also not falsified. So, um, but also obviously this, this is not a matter of degree. So, right, like if a theory is not falsified, it's not falsified, <laughs> period. But we want, a, we want a appraisal we can use to compare theories with each other. Um, so you might, I want to say something like and we've used the theory to derive true predictions. Um, I mean, that it's not falsified means it, 
No, okay. So yeah, that's so so first of all, just that the theory makes any true predictions, like it can be used to derive true predictions, already narrows it down because most of those theories that are not falsified also don't make any true predictions, right? Like they don't say anything about the data. Yeah. Uh, similar to like kind of Carnap's notion of like a So, so, um, uh, remember Popper, when he was discussing what would make a theory empirical, said we could use it to derive new predictions. That means given initial conditions, obviously. And uh, um, so, well, so, okay, so we'll make it empirical is that it can be used to derive any prediction. <laughs> um, so uh, that's that's like a timeless logical fact about the theory that it can be used, right? That it implies, in conjunction with some possible initial conditions, it implies more than the initial conditions. Um, but um, so. And, and that, he said, is the same as falsifiability, right? He showed that that was the same criterion as falsifiability. Here we're saying, and, you know, and that's not a matter of degree. If theory is either falsifiable or it's not. Here we're saying, have we actually used it to derive predictions that turned out to be true? So if it's not falsifiable, we couldn't have used it that way, right? That is, if it's not falsifiable, it can't be used to make new predictions that go beyond the initial conditions. But, um, um, but whether it actually has been used to make predictions that go beyond the initial conditions, and those predictions came out, um, is a separate question, and that's not a timeless fact about the theory, right? Like, it could be that yesterday we never used it to make any prediction, but today we may use it to make a prediction, and but it still hasn't, we still haven't found out if the prediction was true or not. And, you know, tomorrow we'll find out the prediction is true. So, like, so again, just like falsify as opposed to falsifiable. Is the right kind of thing to put in here because it's, it changes relative to what we've actually done. So this is also the right kind of thing to put in here. And moreover, this one looks better because this could be a matter of degree, right? Like how many predictions have we used it to derive? I mean, and this is kind of the same as saying that we've tested the theory. We've used it to make predictions. If the predictions haven't come out true, the theory might have been falsified. So, uh, so we passed the test. But nevertheless, Popper says this isn't sufficiently specific to be Define corroboration because, um, roughly speaking, not all predictions are equal. Right? Like, um, a lot of predictions are things that we basically expect to happen anyway. What we want the theory to do is to make like bold predictions. <laughs> Right, we want the theory to predict things that we wouldn't expect to happen if we hadn't heard this theory. 
Now, I mean, so notice already this is relative not only to like what evidence we have so far, but also to like something about our psychological state. You know, like about what we expect to happen. Um, so what Popper actually ends up saying along these lines, and this is only part of the definition of corroboration, but it's an important part, is that um, His past severe and sincere attempts to test it. <laughs> right? So, this word sincere shows even more strongly how, like, this is, this is presumably a psychological question. How sincere were we? Did we actually think that the theory might be falsified by this test? And that's why we were doing it. Um, I'm not sure severe is means kind of the same thing, or I mean, I don't know. Maybe actually severe is really that part. That there was really we really thought the theory might fail this test. Sincere means we really were willing to give up the theory if it if it failed the test. I guess maybe I'm not sure. Maybe I, I like he uses both these words, but he doesn't like give any guidance to why those two words. <laughs> um, but anyway, so right. So the overall idea is that it's not just that we happen to have derived a whole bunch of true predictions from the theory. It's that we looked at the theory, we looked for things that it predicts that we really wouldn't have expected that if it weren't for the theory. And we deliberately went out and created those conditions and we're really in suspense. <laughs> and we're really thinking, will the theory pass this test or not? And it passed. <laughs> so a theory that has passed more tests like that is better corroborated. All of the things we need for. So, I mean, this is not exactly the same as justification, right? Like the way an inductivist imagines it. The inductivist is not going to impose these requirements. It's just, right? Like, or at least the inductivist is going to have a hard time deriving these requirements. It's, it certainly seems like every time you find a white swan, the theory all swans are white should get a little bit more powerful. And it shouldn't matter whether you pretty much expected them to be white or not, right? Like, what difference does that make? Um, but from Popper's point of view, it makes a big difference because um, um, the theory isn't justified, but we have a tendency to believe it. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Seems like uh, the last part about like passing a year of the theory test. I kind of went through something earlier about how like philosophers will often like refute arguments against against them in in the uh, in their philosophical work. Kind of like assuming this antagonism that uh, like relative to the world of the ethics community, or maybe even like uh, this notion of like a, a dialogue in the community of ethics. Would that be correct? Well, that, you know, so I mean, so, so the thing about philosophers like giving the argument for the other side, I mean, uh, that was something I was talking about. Popper, I think, does talk about that other place, and he doesn't talk about that here, but um, but he does that here. <laughs> and yeah, I think what Popper says when he does talk about it in other places is that it is a kind of generalized version 
uh, right? So like what he's doing here is not empirical science. The argument between him and inductivist is not empirical science. So he's not literally putting his theory up to severe tests in this sense, but like empirical tests. But he's but he but he thinks that like even outside of empirical science, we can have a, like a more general version of this. Like you should be open to criticism and you should look for you know arguments that go against what you think. Um, yeah, so and I, I think like I said, I think therefore. Popper is in a, a good position to explain why philosophers like to do that, uh, why they should like to do that. I mean, whether that's the right explanation or not, I'm not so sure. But anyway, yeah. I already know this is not the right way to think about this, but what if, is this difference kind of like um, what if Swan, an inductivist, would keep finding swans in America that are white? So he doesn't say it should make you believe it more. Okay. Yeah. You will believe it more, right? But he doesn't say it should make you believe it more. But it does say it should make you prefer it over another theory that hasn't passed tests like that. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, like in the case of all swans are white, it's, I mean, also, ones are white is not a very good scientific theory. <laughs> it doesn't make all predictions. <laughs> Pretty much just predicts that all swans would, you know, I mean, so it's, but yeah, I mean, I guess if you say, yeah, it makes the bold prediction that swans everywhere, no matter how strange it'd be white. I mean, the, the, the problem with, like, So to test it, you have to set up the initial conditions. And I'm not sure how you can do that in this case, right? So you could like go to Mars, but you won't see any swans. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, but yeah, you can search in weird places on Earth, like Australia. That's pretty weird, right? And, uh, you know, so, um, um like I mean it's not not only is it it's not a good scientific theory admit first of all it's just it's not like I mean we don't really tend to believe that there if there were, were swans somewhere on some other planet that were not related to our swan thing what I mean that's like <laughs> so uh, I mean the, the truth is I don't think I don't think we when we think that we are thinking as with universal at all we're thinking American universal but yeah you know, so um and like I can think of analogous things but that have the same problem but at least, at least you could you could see again the same type of you know, like if I say all living things have DNA, then if I want to subject that to severe tests, I should look at like ocean vents and you know, like weird places where there are weird things. But um, but again, it's like I don't you know. Does anyone even believe that all living things, are, if there are living things on other planets, have to use the same molecule? Like you know. <laughs> Right, so, um, um, you know, so I mean, he's thinking more about like physical theories, obviously, you know, so like, you know, the theory of general relativity makes this prediction about gravitational waves, um, you know, that if two masses are orbiting each other, orbiting their common center of mass, 
Um, so like according to Newtonian mechanics, they'll just do that forever. But according to general relativity, um, this it's kind of like a, you know a charge going in a circle and it's radiation because it's accelerating. So these masses going in a circle will emit gravitational radiation. And so you expect this orbit. So it's like energy is going out of the gravitational radiation. You expect this orbit to decay. So that's something you never would have expected. And moreover, it makes a really precise prediction about the rate at which you expect the orbit to decay. So like not only wouldn't you have expected it, but you certainly wouldn't have expected that exact amount if you'd never heard of the theory. And then you go out and, you know, so they found like a binary pulsar. So it's two neutron, I mean, you can't see this at all, like the Earth going around the sun, because the masses aren't big enough and close enough to each other, but like gravitational fields are too weak. But they found a binary pulsar with like two neutron stars in a tight orbit around each other. And um, sure enough, the orbits decay in exactly the right way. That's a severe test, right? Whereas all you've done, you know, general relativity also predicts that all the planets will continue in the same orbits that Newtonian mechanics predicts for them, except Mercury, which is a little bit of an anomaly. So, I mean, there's tons of true predictions there. You could just count those up, but those don't really count because that's not something I Right, and every other binary, like every binary star, like normal star, we expect the period to stay the same. General relativity predicts that, but that's not a severe test. But here's a severe test. So general relativity has passed a really severe test, and it's true that I mean, it's a good question. I don't know if it increased scientists or whatever scientists. Most scientists never think about general relativity. Kind of like geologists, <laughs> but, but, but like, um, you know, uh, physicists who think about general relativity, I don't know if it increased their belief that the theory is true, but it certainly was a big deal when it passed this test. And they were happy to find, right? Like, this is the kind of initial condition that's not easy to set up. So get two neutron stars, and <laughs> but fortunately, they found it somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, like I think like this notion of like of, of passing like severe sincere tests seems to like assume this kind of like underdog story of this theory, you know, this theory will like get through all these tests, you know, and they'll survive and become solid paradigms. But how does proper factoring like institutional norms or certain kind of things we should have their paper sort of theory I feel like is that considered as a proper analysis or Popper just think that, you know, if we have this um, theory in the space of reasons, everyone will barely expect to test against the, the, the current theory, and then, you know, we'll have a new one and we'll be happy. Well, Popper thinks we should do that. And Popper thinks that modern scientists have succeeded, not obviously 100% in doing that, but they have succeeded in doing that well enough that science has made this amazing progress, right? I mean, that's, those, are the, those are the two things he has to claim. He doesn't have to claim that everyone always does this <laughs> or you know, that everyone has always done this or that modern scientists themselves have always done this perfectly well. He just has to claim that number one, you should, this is the rational way to go. And number two, it is more or less what scientists have done, close enough that they actually have, you know, made this kind of progress to theories that pass more and more severe tests. And that, I guess, so I haven't, like, this, I'm running out of time, and I haven't said what the other parts of corroboration are. So this is one part of corroboration. The other one, um, which, is harder to understand and maybe uh, also, you know, is one of the things that, that he had trouble as time went on. Um, and being precise is you 
degree of falsifiability of theory, which she also calls um, simplicity or improbability. So, like the so first of all, this is a timeless feature of the theory. So it's like if we have two theories and they both pass the same amount of sincere tests, but one of them is simpler or more falsifiable or less probable than the other, then we should prefer the one that's less probable, that is more falsifiable. So like saying it's less probable, he's deliberately saying something that sounds a little paradoxical, right? Because the inductivist says we want to look for theories that are probable. And proper is like, no, we want to look for theories that are improbable. But then it's, they're not really arguing about the same thing. It's a little bit, right? Like improbable means not like, it means the same thing as highly falsifiable. It, it means that like, it's really strong. It's a really strong theory that makes really um, precise predictions. And so there's more things that were falsified. So I mean, and and he makes some case that that's the same thing that we really are looking for when we say that a scientific theory should be simple. We're looking for a simple theory that explains the data. But I you know I don't have time to try and explain this, but uh, I'll just I mean. It's kind of like, it's like a simple theory is not like a small theory <laughs> or a theory that can be written down in a really small space. Really, you can write any theory down in a small space by defining your terms the right way. It's, it's like a theory that says a lot per unit theory, so to speak. <laughs> right? So I think that's like the kind of, uh, roughly speaking, the way this turns out to be the same as falsifiability or improbability. It's like the, the simple theory is one that um, kind of quickly rules out a lot of possibilities. Yeah. So it's kind of like the less niche and like hard to test that something is, and like the more open it is to like attacks, I guess, the, the better it is, the stronger it is, as long as it yeah. stands up to all of those uh, yeah. tests. Yeah, but it's like, you know, so he gives the example of the theory that the paths of planets are ellipses versus the theory that the paths of the planets are circles, that like this one is more improbable or falsifiable than this one. And it's, you know, again, it's a comparative thing. I don't, he, I think he did try somewhere to define absolute degrees of logical probability or something, but all it really needs is this comparison, right? So like, since every circle is an ellipse, you know, um, um, this theory rules out everything that that theory would rule out and more, <laughs> right? Because this theory rules out everything that's not an ellipse. And moreover, it also rules out ellipses that are not circles. So this theory is more falsifiable. And here, I think you can see clearly why also you would say this theory is simple. Right, so he's saying, I mean, of course, this, this theory is falsified, right? The, the planets don't, the hours of the planets are not circles. But if it were not falsified, we were trying to decide between these two, we would prefer this one because it's simpler. Um, so, I'm out of time to say. <laughs> I, I guess I'll just, I mean, I think I kind of have, like, over the course of lecturing about proper, said all the pieces of this. But, you know, so why is it rational to prefer the theory that's better corroborated in this sense? Um, and the reason is, again, because, like, 
psychologically speaking, you're going to believe the theory that you give the better appraisal to. You should, so, um, and you're going to rely on this. Um, so what's, what's rational is to prefer the one that won't lead you towards dogmatism, that won't get you stuck. <laughs> and that's also the most useful theory. Um, so, you know, as we at each stage find better and better corroborated theories, first of all, they will, right? Like, we're going to find theories that can pass all the tests that the old one test passed and more tests. So, we're going to get that inductivist looking progress. And we're going to tend to believe that they're true more and more. Um, and we tend to believe that they're going to be useful more and more. But at least, fortunately, we have this method that will prevent us from getting stuck in a dead end. Um, and then this part, you know, uh, we must believe that our theory could be true. <laughs> but sorry, I don't have time to say anything about that. Um, uh, all right, I already went over. All right, so I'll see you on Thursday.